So Stuart, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we walk into the future, can you quickly tell us a little bit about your background? Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Birmingham. My father was the, the coach for Aston Villa. Yeah. And so I, I was very, very, I was introduced very early to the, to the arena of sport. And uh, that is, that was something that I suppose you could say it sort of introduced me to the concept of coaching and leadership. So at a very early age, I was, I was fascinated by people that, that seemed to me to be inspirational, even at a very young age. You know, I got, I got that, that sort of tingle when I yeah. sat listening to a team talk, a motivational speech, you know. Right. And so I was maybe intoxicated is the right word. Uh, very at a very early age. And can you tell us who in particular uh, inspired you? I think the earliest the earliest one would have to be my father, because obviously you look up to your father and you and you listen especially attentively to your father. Uh, I didn't understand at the time, but I was a young a young footballer. Uh, with a father that was the coach at Aston Villa and should therefore probably had all sorts of performance anxiety, but I never did. And I've, I've learned now and I've understood now that that was, that was leadership on the very high scale by my father who was, didn't, want, didn't want to put pressure on me. He supported me. He didn't want to... Buy, bask in the yeah. in the glories of his footballing son he allowed me to be what i would be you know and the, and i think that's very difficult in, in terms of leadership especially being a parent that's very difficult to to find that so that was for me i realized now that that was excellent leadership so stuart was soccer always your dream career or did you also look at other other avenues well, my my career my career shouldn't really have happened. You know, I was I was uh, I suffered very very badly as a child with asthma, yeah. and so when the careers officer at, at school would ask me, "Yes, young man, what are you going to be when you leave school?" Well, I'm going to be a footballer. Well, no, we can't say you're going to be a footballer because that depends on a lot of things, and you know your health is no no no. I'm going to be a footballer. So there was never anything else in my mind. They pushed me. I was very good at languages, so they pushed me towards that. I was, I was quite a good. I was a little bit more low, low key physically than football, so they pushed me towards that. But I found my way back to football all the time, and despite the, the the handicap of having to battle through that asthma until it then receded, it was uh, it was the only thing that I wanted to do. And I was completely focused. And Stuart, can you tell us where did you start your playing career? Started my playing career professionally at Preston North End. My father was my father left Aston Villa and he moved to Scotland. And I moved with him, went to school in Scotland, and I played for the local team. Uh, the local team was one of the best, let's say, amateur teams in, in Scotland. So I played with them and I got picked up then by a scout from Preston and I left home at the age of 15 and uh, moved to Preston to be an apprentice. Now, Stuart, you've been coaching all over the world. Um, you've been PSL coach of the season twice. You won the uh, not only the South African Championship, but also, I believe, the Swedish one. You won the Finnish mm -hmm. one. You've been a national yeah. team coach with South Africa and Finland. Um, yeah. Looking back over your career, what would you say were the highlights? What were the best moments? It's easy when you're a coach or you're a leader of any sort to, to reflect on your success 
yeah. has been the moment. But I don't think that I don't think if you're if you're a modern leader or if you're a modern coach, I think that if you just only reflect on your success, that moment that we lifted the trophy, if you if that is your uh, assessment of your success, then I think your work is ego driven. So I think I would I would suggest that some of the the best moments that I've experienced, of course, the success is a sort of receipt that you've done okay, son, you know, there you go. But to reflect only on that is too, is too simple. The process, the process and some of the moments in that process where you realised that you've got it right. We are, we, you, you get feedback from your players. You get you see a young player maturing. Uh, those moments, are, and, and they are probably, I could, I could tell you it was great when I won the double or played in the Champions League final with, uh, with Kaiser Chiefs or played against Barcelona for AIK Stockholm in the Champions League. Or, you know, we, we, we can all reflect on those moments of success, but the process taking me there, I have some really special memories there and and probably there there are too many yeah Uh, they certainly outweigh the the fleeting success when you lifted that you lifted that trophy or you won that game be easy to say when we played in afcon with bafana and we and we beat the host nation egypt yes of course that moment was was uh was unbelievable but that moment disappears and then you go back to your preparation you go back to your creating culture you go back to your interaction with your players and and that for me is the where the leader really lives now Stuart talking about process um you took Finland the Finnish team almost to the mm. World Cup and you almost beat uh, mm. Germany twice right in the World Cup uh, qualifiers yeah I, I must be the only I said I must be the only coach in the world that was dissatisfied with a draw against Germany. You know, it's uh, we drew twice after lead. We led one nil, two one, three two against Germany, and Miroslav Klose scored uh, the equaliser with seven minutes to play in Finland. And then we travelled down to Germany, and we led one zero until the ninety third minute, and with the with the absolute last kick of the game. We didn't even have the chance to, to get the ball uh, and kick off properly. We just moved the ball and it was all over. So those two, those two draws, if we had been turning to, into one of them turning to a, into a win, we would have qualified for the, the World Cup in South Africa. And Stuart, can you maybe tell us um, what is it you did? How did you turn a, a small footballing nation like Finland into a championship beating or a champion beating beating team well i think if if it's if if my travels have taught me anything it's about that you need to be the coach or you need to be the leader that this group needs not the leader that you think you are you know you need to be the coach that can that can communicate and be relevant with this group. And when you move from country to country, that means the culture, the culture of the country will always uh, be an important factor in your creating the culture around the team. So I, th- I just think we got it, we got it right. I understood, I understood what the players had, the strengths that they had, And I understood how to communicate the vision that I had for them, and uh, and we got on well. I respected I respected greatly the the honesty, the integrity, the hard working uh, skills of the of the Finnish lads. And we had some players. We had one or two players that had played in, that were playing in Premier League or in the in the Bundesliga, and those players became very, very dominant. They became very influential and we allowed them to, 
to shine through at the right the right time without it being only about them. So it was it was a really interesting time, very very valuable time for me. And then again, I think in Japan with Hiroshima, you took a, you took mm. a team from the lower ranks of the table to uh, to the championship, and I I believe it had a lot to do with culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually wrote a book. They asked me to write a book in Japan about uh, how to work with Japanese sportsmen because so many, so many foreign coaches had come and they'd failed because they didn't understand the, the, the two hours you have with the players. The other 22 hours, they're out there in Japan being bombarded by a very, very strong culture. And so I'd got a bit of a a history in the martial arts. So when I, when I came down to Japan, I studied a little bit, a, bit, uh, a little bit more about what makes them anxious, what makes them happy, what what makes them motivated, what you absolutely don't want to do, and and from which angle you you would approach your delivery of information or your of your delivery of your vision, you know. Right. So. I th that's where I started. I started in that in that in that sort of aspect, rather than going out onto the field and then just throwing out throwing out the the same sort of sessions that that you'd done in Finland or or England, you know, because it was it was absolutely in many in many respects it was the absolute opposite of what you what you'd done before. And Stuart, what would you say is driving you today? I've thought about that. I've thought about that one, and it's again. I think it's easy to say, um, you know, you you look at yourself as being a winner. You love to win, and you know, I think that's a little bit outdated. I think that the the the, the leader that that basks in that glory of that moment of success is missing missing the point completely. This is this is about a process. This is about one step on a journey. It's not about the destination anymore. And and that is what that is what is important. That the, the people that you are leading have got to want to be led by you. They've got to they've got to enjoy the process. And if you only got if you've got one eye on the destination, then you've only got one eye on what you are actually doing. So the quality of what you're doing, you will lose it. So I think that's what drives me. The, drives me is the process. It's the, it's the communication. It's the, it's the understanding that people are improving. You, you're making a, you're making a difference in someone's life. You know, it's. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I, a, I, don't, I, won't, I won't name the player, but I had a, I had a player here in South Africa who called me and asked me to sit down with him at a, at, at, have, and have a coffee. You know? And he started, he started with tears come to his eyes. And he started telling me that you know, since you. Since you've been coaching me, I've actually got my family out of a very difficult situation. And I've learned so much about myself and about life. And, I've, and, I've, and that has transferred into me being a better footballer and earning more money. And therefore, I've had the, the, the ability to move them out. Now, that, that for me is a success. You know, we were talking before. That for me is a massive success. I told him, I said, listen, listen. So the magic is not here. The magic is there. You're the one that's done that, and I'm and I'm thrilled that you you take the time to sit down and, and tell me and be appreciative. But the magic is with you. You've done it. I haven't done it. Now that, for me, that is that is as as valuable as going to the no camp and playing against Barcelona or or playing in Egypt to be, and beating the home nation. That's that's as important. So Stuart, would you agree that to be a better player, you have to be a better person? I would think. I think that if you're gonna if you're gonna reach meaningful success as a player, as a as a banker, as a as a tennis as a tennis player, if you're gonna reach meaningful success, then yes, you do. You the Japanese have got a a, a, a word called ikigai. 
Yeah. And, and we and we and we always misinterpret what they what they write about in Japan. But ikigai is about having a, a more purposeful life, finding your purpose in life. Now, one of the one of the criteria that in the West when we describe an ikigai is that you make you make money through that, through finding right. your purpose. But the Japanese don't think that. They don't think that. They think that you no. can finding your purpose in life. You can only do without the ego. And as soon as you're looking for rewards, then the ego comes into place. Now, for me, meaningful success means that finding your purpose, being motivated to find your purpose. If your purpose is about I want to make more money, then that will be fleeting. So being a better person for me is ikigai, finding your purpose. What motivates you? What is your passion in life? And once you've found that, I think then you can only do that through self-reflection. So all of those things make you a better person. If you reflect on what you're doing, the, the quality of what you're doing, the motivation for what you're doing. I think that sort of reflection, Ikigai, I think that is, uh, that is key for any, any sportsman or businessman. Right. Now, Stuart, looking into the future, what does the future of leadership mean to you? I think it means new problems. It means new challenges. Yeah. Uh, again, again, I think the modern coach, the modern leader, he's not, he's not just the military leader that we had in the past. The, the, the hairdryer, Sir Alex Ferguson, roaring into the face of a, of a David Beckham sitting there like a child. This, that is not leadership anymore. You know, leadership is a, a, a host of things. And it's getting more complicated because society is becoming more complicated. Social media throws up a, a challenge of performance anxiety, uh, loneliness, inadequacy that we have got to bridge. And you don't bridge, you don't bridge that with creating more fear in the environment. So for me, the challenges will be in the future that they will be your communication skills, your ability to, to help people find their ikigai, right. <laughs> find, the, find their purpose. And hopefully the purpose will be that they want to be on board whatever you are doing, whatever you are leading. Leadership is not an easy, an easy, uh, an easy skill. And it's becoming more multifaceted. So some days you'll be a, a facilitator. Some days you'll be the coach. Some days you'll be the, the sergeant major. Sometimes you'll be a friend. Sometimes, but all of those times, you've still got to be creating the culture so that, so that people are on board. They are empowered. And that is becoming more and more difficult because it's becoming, society is becoming more and more complicated. Right. So, Stuart, what have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important for building future leaders? In other words, what is it we have to do more of to encourage, to empower, uh, to enable future leaders? Well, I think, firstly, firstly we, have to, we have to have an element of self-reflection. Hmm. I think that we have looked upon leaders as being either winners or losers. We've created that that environment and, and I think that's starting from the wrong point. A winner, well, what do you win? Do you win by making a lot of money? Do you win by taking points and being higher in the table? Is that automatically the leader that we want? Or is the leader that we want, firstly, and we can look at a few football coach coaches, Jürgen Klopp. Jürgen Klopp at Liverpool is at the moment winning everything. And he does that by what? Creating a culture. The culture fits the supporters. It fits the players. The, the players are empowered by him. The players love him. They, they, they would run through a brick wall for him. But that is not because he's, it's the fear factor. That is because the culture is very, very strong. And so I think... 
we, we have to look at ourselves. We have to look at our ability to create that culture. And that does not mean that you never criticize people because people, they want critique. People want to get better, but they want honest, accurate criticism that will help me develop. They don't want vague, vague, uh, insulting, uh, derogatory criticism. You know, you need to be the leader that you would follow. And I think that's, that's a, a little bit of a key creating that culture so that if you were someone being led, you would be motivated and inspired to follow that person. Right. Now, Stuart, I believe soccer is not just a game. It's also the most engaging activity on this planet. I mean, we have millions, mm -hmm. billions of soccer fans. It brings joy to our lives. Um, mm -hmm. It motivates us. What is it that we can maybe learn from the game of soccer and apply it in life? And yeah. maybe business. That's a, it's a it's a great it's a great point. I think that's sport in general, you know, sport in general, but maybe especially soccer. It's a team sport. One, you've got to be you've got to give a part of yourself for the good of the team. That's a healthy attitude. Right. You've got to be able to take the good and the bad. You you make mistakes. Does that affect your confidence? Does it affect your self esteem? Does it affect your self image? You know, you've got to be able to pick yourself up after a defeat. You know, I watched the Europa League last night, Glasgow Rangers. Glasgow Rangers lost to Eintracht Frankfurt. You'll be very happy yeah. sure. about that. I am. Me, I'm wearing, that's, you see, I'm wearing black today. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, of course. I think they have to play the Scottish Cup final at the weekend. And they've just lost in an absolutely, an absolutely tragic way for them. So they will, be, they will be very, very down. But they have to pick themselves up. Yeah. And champions, champions, said Muhammad Ali, are not the ones that never get knocked down. They're the ones that get up and win. And so that's, that's what sport can teach you. You know, in Japan, in Japan they, if you talk about Aikido, you know, It should be karate do. Karate, right. the empty hand, and do is the way to enlightenment through the empty hand. So right. you you learn you learn about yourself through the challenges of uh, learning karate, and it's the same as, as soccer. And soccer gives you all the challenges in life if you reflect, if you if you look at yourself. How have I dealt with that? For me, self-confidence is finding a challenge, getting past that challenge, stopping, looking back and saying, well, you did okay there. Well done. You know, that strengthens your self-confidence, which is why, you know, children should face challenges. You know, Absolutely. There's, a, there's, a saying, there's a saying that the smooth water's never made a good sailor. You know, and so those challenges in life, we we should we should embrace them. So and Stuart, football gives you, the, gives you the opportunity to do that. Yeah, Stuart, talking about challenges, obviously these are challenging times um, for most everybody. And what is your advice for future leaders? What kind of challenges should they expect to encounter and hopefully overcome in their career? I think you, you make your own toolbox as a leader. I mean, we've spoken about a few things there. You make your own toolbox. Yeah. And you need to have the tools if you're going to be a facilitator, if you're going to, be, if you're going to create a vision, you need to communicate that vision. So you, you get your tools, you'll get your qualifications, and you'll get your philosophy. And from that, you will create your strategies. And that will be tailor-made to the group or the company or the, the team that you're working with. So that's, that's, what we've, that's what leaders do. And they have their leadership style, which, which can be one of about 11 things, I'm guessing. But they'll have their style. But then you've got to, you've got to say, well, what if? Right. Pat Riley, Pat Riley, the, Pat Riley the, the New York Knicks basketball coach, Uh, he, 
he described it as being when lightning strikes the pandemic, who would have thought, okay, what tools do we have? How to, how to stop the pandemic creating loneliness, which is the opposite of teamwork, team spirit. Right. How to stop that and to reconnect into our way of dealing with this. How to create, how to strengthen the feeling of I am needed, I am wanted, I am important. When the pandemic is doing the opposite, when the government are passing laws almost to destroy team spirit and to destroy what you are trying to do as a leader. So when lightning strikes, you must respond. As a leader, you must respond. So that is, that is don't, don't let that crack the core of your leadership. And I think the future, so you're asking me, Nick, the question, and I'm going to say, well, you've got your toolbox, and that will get you through most things. But when lightning strikes, the modern leader needs to have a response. Right. Um, and Stuart, if you were to design a curriculum for future leaders, what skills, mm. maybe one or two skills, would you consider most important for, for what skills would you want to impart on, for future leaders? I would, I would like to, I would like to, I mean, the, the, the normal, the normal, I'm not going to say cliche, cliche ish uh, in advice. You know, of course, of course, you've got to, of course, you've got to have your, your own philosophy. Of course, you can have that, that toolbox that I'm talking about. You've got to create your own strategies and you've got to put them all together and you've got to understand how important delivery is and communication, et cetera, et cetera. But what I would say is a special maybe weapon that you've got is to meditate, remove the ego, fill your life with gratitude, and that is what you can then demand from your group. Because without that egoless flow in your group, again, I think Pat Riley called it the, uh, the innocent climb. Phil Jackson, the, the Chicago Bulls coach, he spoke of it as being the spiritual element of our team, of our team, which is they, they were... They were full of gratitude and the ego is then moved to the side. So I think the self-reflection of the coach, the leader, he needs also, she needs also to move the ego to one side. Otherwise, you're motivated by all the wrong things. And then right. that would probably the single, the single most... Uh, apart from the normal things... The single yeah. element that I would encourage with, uh, with any leader. Now, Stuart, you touched on mentoring, and obviously, you've been a mentor formally or informally to so many future mm -hmm. leaders. Can you maybe share yeah. a success story or two where you mentored an upcoming leader and that person took your advice to heart? I always think, I always think it sounds a little bit. A little bit uh, conceited when you start ram rambling off people sure. that you've affected positively. But I think, in general, I think when you've affected someone uh, to the degree that they that they desire to follow the path that you've trodden, right. then I think I think that's fantastic. If they seek your advice. And they, they become successful. Again, it's like the player that sits down and tells you, This is, you know, this is how you've affected my life. When when people follow you, that's 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 marvelous. When when they follow and they ask you your advice, that's flattering. But when they are successful, that feeling is fantastic. Now I I was in Japan and the team that I coached in Japan, eight, eight of the players became top league coaches 
and one of them is now the Japanese national coach. The, my, assistant in, my assistant in Finland is now the senior national coach and doing very, very well. Uh, in South Africa here, I've, I've had many, many coaches that I've worked with that have gone on and uh, have gone on and stood on their own two feet and created a, a very good life for themselves through sport. And those are the those are the ones that the, the Swedish national coach at the moment was my assistant uh, in my very first job when I was a very young coach. He was he was my assistant and he's now the Swedish national coach. So there are there are many people that have followed in my footsteps or they've they've been motivated or inspired to create their own and that's without making it sound like I was responsible because I was like my father I was I was mentoring them but it wasn't my it wasn't my intention my intention was to support them empower them and allow them to grow and find their own journey that's ikigai again right and Stuart, looking back over your own leadership um, career, um, are there any role models of leadership that you came across and that future leaders should maybe study and learn from? Well, well I, was, I, was a big, I was a big fan of diversity. So I could find leadership, I could find leadership in, in, in unbelievably strange places, you know. It would be... I mean, I'll, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. You know, I, I was in Japan and I went to I went to uh, a concert. Yeah. It was the three tennis. It was the three tennis, and uh, Plas Domingo Pavarotti. Right. We we were there watching it, and they did two encores, and the crowd wanted another encore, and the conductor. Of, I watched the conductor. Especially, I, I can't remember his name. He was Hungarian, but uh, I watched him specifically, and he looked. He looked at the orchestra. He tapped. He tapped with his baton, and he looked at them, and he went, "No sleeping." <laughs> what he was saying. What he was saying is, yeah. "This is you have been magnificent. Right. Don't let yourselves down." Now that was for me. That was leadership. That was. That was, I was sitting there and I was tingling because I found the leadership in that you are the best in the world. You are the best in the world. At this moment, it would be easy to switch off. No one switches off. We go for perfection. Now, they then, they then played a, a version of Nessam Dorma and it was absolutely incredible. But, uh, but, I find leadership in all those things. I can find leadership with, with Phil Jackson, who was very spiritual, and, I've, and, and Pat Riley, basketball coaches, and football coaches, and politicians, Mandela. I, I, I find leadership everywhere. And, I, and it can be a, a parent, a parent showing great leadership, or someone, at one of our sponsors at, a, at South African breweries, for example, you know, the, yeah. the, the showing leadership. And I think... If we're alert to that fact, we can see good and bad, and we can learn from the bad, the bad leadership as well. All right. Now, Stuart, how can our listeners connect with you, and where should they follow you? Well, I have to say, I don't know if this, I don't know if this sounds uh, as if I'm selling myself short, or it's, it, it's, uh, or how it sounds, but. I don't, I don't, I don't interact very much with the social media. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn, LinkedIn because that's a professional courtesy for me and, uh, and other professionals. Uh, but at the moment, I'm writing my book. I'm in the process of writing my book. The publishers have uh, have uh, decided that uh, that I should, and uh, are encouraging me, and and I've just and I've just started. So in the near future, hopefully, that will be. Uh, that will be on the market, and uh, and it's not a kiss and tell. It's not a kiss and tell of right. my career. It's more of a. It's more of a. Why did this happen, and and how did this happen? Okay, so is your book going to 
look over your entire career? It's going to look as far back as me starting as this asthmatic child that wanted to become, that had a dream to be a footballer. And that's where, that's where it will start. And it will go through until very, very recently. Right. And can you reveal when you're looking to launch? I'm hoping it'll be this year. Okay, great. Now, last but not least, Stuart, what is your message to the millions of kids who are now finishing school or looking to enter the uh, world of work, start a career? What is maybe one or piece, one or two pieces of advice that they should uh, they should heed? Well, I think if if they've been listening now, <coughs> excuse me, if they've been listening now, they'll realise that I don't believe that it's a it's a good start to call yourself a winner and look at the the trophy you want to win, the bank account you want to build, the Ferrari you want to drive. I don't think that that is in any way, shape, or form a good starting place. Knowledge is a good starting place. Uh, finding your icky guy, what is your passion? What will what will fulfill you in life? Not just what will give you that that rush when you lift a trophy. I think if you if you can get that into your into your psyche first, then it's about be humble, be humble, work hard, move your ego to the side, show gratitude. Those mental skills will help you along your journey immensely, much more than people saying you must want it badly. You know, right. that sort of motivation is very temporary. You know, you've got to find a passion. You've got to be able to communicate. Leaders need to communicate. Nick, if, if I'm sitting here and you don't understand a word that I'm saying, You know, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you an example from the football world. Yeah. Unai Emery is an unbelievably talented coach. He went to England and was ridiculed, not because of his quality of coaching, but because of his communication skills. His English was just not, not. It wasn't good enough for the players to be able to understand clearly everything that he wanted. So he was ridiculed. He left England, went back to Spain and showed again. He's an unbelievably talented coach. The only problem was communication. Not knowledge, not personality, not humility, not egoless. He was, he was only, he, he was only looked at, looked at as being a failure because of the lack of communication skills. So that is, even top, top people, if they can't communicate their vision, if they can't communicate, they're going to struggle. So those things, I would say, make sure you get those in place, in your toolbox, on your belt as weapons, before right. you even consider moving into the, the competitive arena. Well, Stuart, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom into the future of leadership and uh, inspiring us in, uh, in, in, in this in incredibly important activity of, uh, of sport and especially soccer. Thanks, Nick. It's been my pleasure, Nick. Thank you.